Welcome to Climate Plus, a DevX podcast. I'm Michael Igo, senior reporter at DevX. Every year, usually around this time, the world turns its attention to climate change and what we're doing or not doing about it. At the UN Climate Conference, or COP, negotiators get deep into the weeds on every aspect of the climate crisis. This year, it's happening in Dubai. To help make sense of this complex, critical moment, we're bringing you conversations with leading climate thinkers, activists, and experts, and asking them, can COP28 deliver? I think the amounts that have started to be pledged are not insignificant in terms of magnitude, but are a trifle, a minuscule amount of what is needed. And so the work has only just begun. It's become something of a tradition in climate policy. At every annual COP, the negotiations seem to boil down to a few highly contentious issues, a few key words or phrases, and as the clock ticks down to the end of the two-week summit, the whole process seems to be on the brink of collapse. This year, it was the fight over a fossil fuel phase-out. Often, it's about finance. But in the end, at least most years, some kind of last-ditch diplomatic effort prevails, and delegates go back home with a modest sense of accomplishment. But of course, it's a bit of an illusion, because the words on the page that allow negotiators to pack up and go home don't actually do anything to stop climate change or make people safer. It's less like building a house and more like agreeing that what you should build is a house. And now you have to figure out how to do that. Take the new loss and damage fund, for example, which will support countries experiencing the worst impacts of climate change. How do you measure that? What's the relationship between climate vulnerability and economic status, for example? How do you measure the cost of climate change? With COP28 now in the rearview mirror, Dr. Jean Leon, the president of the Caribbean Development Bank, is thinking a lot about these questions and what to do now that the work really begins. He spoke to my colleague at Vaas Aldinger. Dr. Leon, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you, Adva, for having me. I look forward to uh, the conversation. So maybe we'll jump right in. You've had, you know, maybe about a week now to reflect on um, this year's COP climate conference. And I'm curious sort of what your key takeaways are. Are there places where progress was made? Are there things that you're disappointed by or surprised by coming away from it? And how does that inform your work moving forward? Thanks for that, uh, Adva. Um I I think for sure I have to remain optimistic. And so I would not use disappointment, but I would surely want to say that progress has been made. And I, I, I say that because my general approach is to see COP not as an event, but a series of events that outline and facilitate a process of change. And so to the extent that we have advanced from 2015 uh, through to where we are at the end of COP28, tells me that progress is, is being made. It might not look a lot, but as long as it is progress, I think that is the, the positive side that we need to look at. And so maybe to, to put this in perspective, Let's, um, let, let's see what were the few big things going into COP. We were looking at what were the efforts that needed to be made or had been made in terms of mitigation. We were talking about the 100 billion 
dollar pledge that had been in the offing for a while. We were discussing adaptation finance, doubling that. And uh, we were looking equally at the prospect of the global stock tick and what would be the new collective um, quantitative goals. So all of those were things that were in train, as it were. And maybe people had ideas, expectations that all of those would likely generate uh, full amounts of, um, of, of results or, or specific outcomes. And so if I look back now at all of those, uh, one, we did not get to the point of phasing out uh, fossil fuels, but at least there's now a mention of transition away from fossil fuel to, to provide energy systems with the, the necessary um, basis. So I think that's, that's a plus. Uh, not as much, obviously, as was wanted, but it's a plus in, in that direction. Adaptation finance still made it into the text to double that. Um, not as much as one would have wanted, um, but of course it is there and it remains a goal to be, to be had. You are looking at the setting up of the global facility, climate facility, the 30 billion started by the UAE with the, the goal of maybe attracting another quarter trillion uh, to, to put to that. It's small, almost peanuts, as it were, in terms of need. If we think of uh, 18, 20 trillion that is required, but at the same time, 30 billion is not something you scoff at. It's, it's still a lot of money and it's still seed money to start. We are looking at um, the starting of the loss and damage fund, about 800 million now in the, in the offing. Again, peanuts. It's a quarter of 1% of the need of approximately, say, 4 trillion annually that you need, but it is still a start. And so I, I think while I don't want to use the word you said, disappointments, um, and while I will be equally open to say we have not gone as far as we ought to, I think all of those are positive um, promises. We are looking at, for example, the number of, of um, companies that have agreed to reduce methane emissions. That's uh, a fairly large amount. We are looking at, on a positive side, maybe something that has been missing in COPs, the connection of climate and what I like to call the impact of climate on the multifaceted aspects of human lives. So now we are recognizing, um, starting in June actually, with President Macron in Paris, um, that climate and poverty um, are linked. Uh, now we are seeing climate and health is linked. And we are in the region at least noting climate and even education is linked. And we know already climate and water is linked. So climate and food is linked. Climate and shelter is linked. And so when you put all of those together, the various things that make up lives for people in terms of um, their overall prosperity, whether it is food, energy, water, education, health, shelter, all of those are things that are impacted by climate. And for me, one very big thing coming out of, uh, out of COP28 is finally we are start seeing the impact of climate change as impacting a holistic ecosystem that impacts livelihoods. And so while we are talking of climate change and finance for climate change, the discourse has to be returned to financing to promote prosperity, financing to promote livelihoods, financing to generate the sustainable development that we are talking about. So for me, that was a very big, big thing coming out of COP. The, the connecting dots are finally beginning to, to come together. 
And while it is true that we do need a lot, a lot, a lot of money, I think the amounts that have started to be pledged um, are, are not insignificant, but in terms of magnitude, but are a trifle, a minuscule amount of what is needed. And so the work has only just begun. Uh, yeah. And while we are still at pledging stage, obviously the bigger issue is when do those pledges begin to materialize? Climate Plus is supported by the World Bank. Back in October, World Bank President Ajay Banga called for a new vision for ending poverty on a livable planet with a focus on climate action. We cannot endure another period of emission-heavy growth. We must find a way to finance a different world where our climate is protected, where pandemics are manageable, if not preventable, where food is abundant and fragility and poverty are defeated. We do not suffer from a shortage of solutions. We're just paralyzed by a persistent lack of courage to pursue them. The good news is that we have solutions like these within reach and resources at our disposal to scale them. To learn more about efforts to end poverty on a livable planet, search for the World Bank Group at COP28 or click the link in the show notes. One of the things I wanted to ask you about, you you brought up um, loss and damage, and that was really one of the early sort of takeaways from from COP this year. And and really what needs to happen now is for that to be sort of stood up and operationalized. And I'm curious what you think that should look like. What does a fair process look like in terms of you know, figuring out how funding is allocated. I think, right, there are often debates in loss and damage and broader climate finance about should it just go to the lowest income countries, which of course for countries in the Caribbean who are bearing the brunt of a changing climate quite dramatically sometimes excludes them because um, because of where they fall, what be it, you know, middle income or even some higher income countries. So how do you think some of those sort of difficult decisions about who gets um, the funding, who gets what type of funding? Yeah, I think I think that's for me, um, at least from my vantage point, one of the things that would need to be addressed urgently. Um, and I say urgently because while we now have pledges. And while the amount that we are talking about is so huge, there is no there is no mechanism now in terms of criteria to determine how do you prioritize who gets the first dib, uh, how much will you actually give to those who are first on the list? How do you even determine what that need is, and that need is not yet, uh, in, as it were, measured. We talk about whether it goes to low income and vulnerable, but what's the definition of vulnerable? We don't even have that yet as a, a proper definition. And I, I say that because we've been talking uh, vulnerability, augmenting, augmenting national income measures with vulnerability, for the past maybe 30, 35 years. And it is only this year that uh, with the UN's multidimensional vulnerability report, um, the vulnerability index report coming out, that we have even started to articulate that this is one way of augmenting. But even that hasn't passed muster yet. Uh, The World Bank, the custodian of the loss and damage fund, is equally on record to say that they will be looking to advance uh, a definition of vulnerability. Um, It won't be that which was used by the UN uh, MVI, uh, but at the same time, we are not yet sure whether it will still be a income-based measure. Um, From our perspective at the bank, 
all income based measures are simply inadequate they are not based on need they do not provide for an equitable distribution of resources based on need and we have we have advanced and uh, continue to advocate that what you really need is a change in paradigm that one we need to anchor the entirety of our measure on the concept of resilient prosperity which is based on a foundation of social justice that sees prosperity as a holistic system and therefore it touches all aspects of social institutional environmental um and financial and even the broader um productive capacity of um of countries and when you blend those together what you come up with is a measure of resilience and resilience is the the bigger part for us because what it does say is that even if you have a measure of structural vulnerability um having obtained that it becomes a retrospective backward looking snapshot in time but when the event occurs arising from maybe more intense climate change what you end up with is different types of events whether it is floods hurricanes um typhoons or other and when those occur they occur with different intensities and have different impacts on the different elements of the way your fabric your society holds and so you need to be able to distinguish the vulnerability as a susceptibility criterion from the types of events that can occur and the intensity of those events more importantly the damage from those they have impact on how resilient your actual economy can be what we call the recovery duration the time it takes to recover after an event which in itself is dependent upon the state that you were in before and the vulnerabilities you had and that in fact bounces back into vulnerability so you have a sort of dynamic vulnerability that needs to be embedded and so when you measure when you measure a vulnerability of a country it is really the vulnerability resilience nexus and how long does it take you not only to recover after an event but to be able to continue to grow after you have recovered from your pre event level and so that is a measure that i think is applicable to all countries across the world and we will be able to see quite easily um need on the basis of resilience capacity now will take you away from whether you are middle income high income or low income first and foremost and allow you a better measure fairer more equitable more easy not easy more um, embracing encompassing way of ensuring that countries in need and in particular if you focus on loss and damage countries in lead in need from the impact the measure of loss and damage cannot be whether they have already attained or not attained gdp because gdp is going to be decimated changed as a result of the loss and damage permanent loss and damage that would in effect have occurred and what you really want is the ability to reposition the ability to get yourself back on a growth trajectory that you would have had if you did not have that loss and damage effect and i i think equally something that is probably not adequately um mentioned when we discuss those things is shocks need to be distinguished between temporary and permanent shocks and things like loss and damage and the overall climate change that we are talking about these are not the temporary macro shocks that we talk about it is not even a temporary shock of a natural hazard these are permanent shocks that will be at least in our case in the region and i think globally 
These are things that will be with you forever, your entire trajectory, your entire life, your entire space has changed and changed fundamentally in a permanent way. And so the solutions cannot be sliced and diced solutions. They have to be yeah. holistic solutions that take into account and encompass the entirety of the livelihoods of people in all of its dimension. You know, whether it's the social side, the productive side, the institutional side, in addition to the environmental side. And so when I started by indicating, yes, we've made a lot of progress, but this is equally a process. And that process itself is evolving. Uh, how many people can generally talk about, for example, what is the cost of climate change? We, we don't know that yet because there are certain elements that we have not yet started to scratch the surface about. And I'll give you just a couple. What is the impact of humans living at 1.5 over pre-industrial and living there in a permanent sense? What's the impact for us on our immune systems, our ability to withstand diseases? What are the types of diseases that could occur at 1.5? What does it mean for our soil chemistry and composition, our ability to grow foods? Will those foods even be able to survive 1.5 or higher? And all of those and the costs attendant to that are in the realm of not even hypotheticals yet. Yes, we are looking at things that we know, things that we can begin to measure, but this is really the flaw the very bottom of the overall cost of climate change. One of the things that that tells us is that whatever sort of metrics or systems are built will probably have to be adaptable, right? Because some of the science, some of the data that will need to inform some of these systems, we don't have yet and will only evolve as the climate continues to change and warm. Um, I did want to talk about some of the sort of specific tools, financing tools that might be used to address some of these challenges. You know, we've seen discussions about a variety of things at COP and before uh, we've seen a number of, you know, debt for nature, debt for climate swaps and several in the, in the Caribbean region. Now we saw discussions of, um, you know, climate debt suspension pauses. I know that's something you guys have worked on that other MDBs are picking up, sort of saying, okay, MDBs are going to pause debt in the event of a climate disaster to let countries sort of get back on track. Um, talking about carbon markets and a number of, of other tools. What sort of tools do you think are going to be most important um, you know, financing tools, particularly for your region? I think uh, you, you hit the nail on the head, Adva. Um, adaptation is going to be key. And adaptation in the following sense, in the sense that we do not yet know either the magnitude or how the climate impact, not climate, the climate impact is going to evolve. Um, what we do know is that unless we mitigate and put in place those mitigating measures that I said at the beginning we probably didn't do enough on, unless we do that, 1.5 is going to get to us much quicker than we even imagine. And I think I saw a recent report from Copernicus that suggests we could be hitting 1.5 around 2034, not in 2045. Now, even if that turned out to be on the, let's say, um, not too pessimistic side, and let's assume that 2034 holds, 2034 would be the end of the next post-Samoa decade um, for small island developing states we're about to go into next year's, um, next year's conference, for SEEDS International Conference, uh, for the period 2025 to, 2020, to 2034. And one of the prospects we are just now looking at is, what if we hit 1.5 degrees centigrade in 2034? What does that mean for SEEDS? And so 
the fact that we are saying we need to adapt for me says we need to embrace in a much more significant way the broad issue of contingent class of instruments. That is the one big thing that I think we need to be focused on. So the debt clauses you mentioned is the beginning of the story. But at the moment, they are still broad, what I call vanilla type. And we have to move beyond vanilla contingent clauses that take into account not only the potential for the greater intensity, greater frequency of natural events, but can distinguish among the different types and intensities of events themselves. Because you cannot assume, and I'll give you a simple example, that the death pause for a tropical depression has to be the same death pause for a Cat 3 hurricane or the same debt pause for a Cat 5 hurricane. Those things are very, three very different events. And so as you start taking that into account, it means we need to now have a suite, as it were, of parameters that begin to define what those contingent types of uh, assets ought to be that benefit the countries in the event of a natural disaster to be um, disaggregated or let's say distinguished in different forms. But it also means that this is going to cost institutions more. And costing institutions more means there has to be some degree of neutrality of impact on balance sheets because the credit rating need to be preserved the ability to go on markets and borrow need to be preserved. Else, the very debt you are trying to help countries mitigate is going to be equally compromised. Um, and the other side to this, you also mentioned this, when you do debt for nature type swaps, yes, it helps to a certain degree, but it does not yet help you with the fact that when the event occurs, your capacity is washed away. Your displacement of people's skills is washed away. But you still need to incur new debt to be able to recover. And so we have to find equal ways, I think, not only of using the debt for nature swaps and other similar instruments for existing debt, but we need to come up with now new innovative ways of pricing future debt that is related to the impact of those climate change events because that's the only way you can get around the issue that most countries, especially post-COVID, have seriously high, almost non-sustainable debt ratios. And it is like the proverbial um, feather on the back, breaks the back of the camel. Any little increase in debt puts you over the edge. And so nobody is willing to give you. But yet, if you have to borrow to do the appropriate thing for adapting or mitigating climate change, then you don't have the ability to borrow. And so you're in that vicious circle of you cannot break out because you don't have the means. And so, yes, part of the debt swap is good, but generally we need to be a little more innovative on what types of reprofiling, the use of those contingent uh, clause instruments that I talked about a little earlier, and a way of separating existing debt from new debt, at least for purposes of debt sustainability analysis. And at the same time, we have to equally get the IMF, the World Bank, to review, almost remap debt sustainability analysis to include properly and embed properly issues of vulnerability, durations for recovery, magnitude of impact of climate change, on countries such that then the need for debt, because we equally agree there will not be adequate grants or concessional finance to do all of 
the climate related things that we need to do. We've already said even the 800 million is one quarter of 1%. Even the 30 billion is at best 10% of 400 billion we are talking about, 400 trillion we are talking about annually. So there will need to be natural debt instruments, full stop. It cannot come from concessional alone, cannot come from grants, cannot come from fiscal space. So we have to have a way of borrowing and hence why this issue of credit rating, ability to borrow, places like the MDBs that are being asked to call to do more, their role now cannot be compromised. So you have to be able to balance out the asset side of your balance sheet to give benefit to countries with the liability side of your balance sheet that the insurance of instruments, and I'm talking here, now we are calling for use of SDRs, we are calling for issuance of um, hybrid capital and other innovative ways of balancing the increased risk on the asset side to get to this more neutral position on your balance sheet position to allow you to continue to develop um, for the impact of climate change. These are all things that would have to be in the mix. More guarantees, more asset protection schemes, more insurance tools that are blended, and blended in particular, not only in the sovereign space, but blended with private sector partnership with the public sector entities, so that we have a national perspective, national goals, national burden sharing, national joint responsibilities to tackle this monster of an event that we are talking about now, the impact of climate change. So there, there are many pieces to the, to the, to the uh, puzzle, Adva, um, but I, I, I want us to, maybe if I had to pick one, the whole issue of contingent class of financing instruments that will be able to allow for the adaptation, the adjustment, the uncertainty when it occurs, how you get out of it for uncertain durations of time, such that you do not have to make a choice between paying your obligations and keeping people alive. So that, that, is the, that is the real story we need to focus on and to recognize that the, the monies, the finance will not come from one place. It has to come from multiple sources. And so for those of us who argue it must only be grants, I would say, let's wake up. Those who argue it will only be concessional finance equally, let's wake up. Um, we, it's not going to be enough. And so we, we have to open up the room, the space for private money, investor class money, international capital markets money, national savings, build on that. Where they exist, deploy them more effectively, more efficiently, so that you get more out of what it is that you need to do. It has to be a joint responsibility joint burden sharing, joint focus to get us over the boundary line of managing what is going to be inevitable, the climate change scourge. And whether we get to yeah. 1.5, it will remain at 1.5. It's not going to go back to zero. So we have to continue to recognize this. It is not about only reducing and preventing us from going beyond 1.5. When we stabilize at 1.5, if we do, how do we live and continue to live in that 1.5 space? Hi, I'm Kate Warren, Executive Editor at DevX. If you're listening to this podcast, you're likely working to achieve the Sustainable Development Goals. But are you subscribed to DevX Newswire? Global development can be a fast-moving, complex sector. Our team of global reporters work every day to bring you the news you need to make sense of it all. In DevX Newswire, we keep you up to date on issues ranging from climate change financing to gender equality 
and global health to transforming the food system, all in a fun-to-read free newsletter delivered directly to you five days a week. Join the hundreds of thousands of global development professionals who receive DevX Newswire and visit devx.com slash newsletters to sign up to this free newsletter today. One of the things I wanted to ask you about is really how, how do you see your role at the Caribbean Development Bank in helping to develop some of these products, right? One of the challenges in the region is obviously, you know, some countries are very small markets that can be make it difficult to attract that private capital to create that mix that you're talking about. So what is the role of the CDB in playing that facilitator, in trying to create these instruments um, that you're talking about? How, what does that mean that your priorities look like in the year ahead on climate? Um, how does that impact your strategies and the way that you're you know, altering your own operations, right? Can you be sort of a testing ground for some of these new instruments or um, types of arrangements uh, and then you know, sort of prove out a case that other MDBs and then institutions can come and follow along? Absolutely, uh, Adver. Um, I, I think we we are doing that in 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 three in three ways. The first is we we believe there's need for a paradigm shift in the way we see development, and we've talked a little about this on the replacement of income GNI. I, a broader beyond GDP measure that I call the internal resilience capacity of countries. And we are already leading um, or even pioneering discussions in that uh, area. And we intend to, and we just got approval by our board of governors at our annual meeting in June of this year to continue to advance this. So we intend to utilize pilot, if you will prefer to use that word, um, pilot the use of alternative measures to classify countries according to need um, as a means of um, doing our own internal lending and other operations. Uh, second is that that cannot be seen as a project uh, basis or projectized basis for development we have to see development as a process. And so connecting the dots both over time and among elements of development is something that we think is another key area of departure of the paradigm so that we are always talking about developing a ecosystem. And that ecosystem is a ecosystem of resilience that looks at productive capacity, environmental, um, capacity, your institutional, your financial, um, and equally the social uh, elements of living. And so when we, when we talk of advancing, we talk of advancing all of those areas. Now, all of those areas mean there's need for a lot of money. And so in that broad space, we have equally started to pioneer, and we are working now with Lazard Brothers um, out of France, on that very instrument that I just spoke of, a risk neutral balance sheet optimizing um, approach that looks at the contingent class of instruments on the, for a benefit of countries, but at the same time with the protection on the liability side that will, in fact, help. Can I interrupt you really quickly on that? For people who might not understand what risk neutral balance sheet optimizing approaches mean, what could that look like? So let, let, me, let me give you a, a simple example. Um, sure. At the moment, and I'll just pick one country that we have, the Bahamas, that has been um, hit by a numerous uh, hurricanes over the last uh, decade, two decades. Uh, let's say that country has an exposure to the bank of about, say, 200 million, for example. Um, and we have that instrument that says the current exposure can be protected, protected now against the 
future event, another hurricane hitting the Bahamas, uh, Cat 3, Cat 5, within the next 10 years. So that probability of uh, one hit in 10 years, we can actually estimate what does that mean if a hurricane were to hit. And under one parametric um, arrangement, we could say if a hurricane Cat 3 hits the Bahamas within the next 10 years, Bahamas will pause its payment of principal and will pause its payment of interest to the bank. Um, so again, for cases of um, illustration, supposing that is about 60 million made up of, say, 35 million principal and 25 million interest, then that 60 million is 60 million now that Bahamas has that it would not need to pay because of the pause. It would be money that we would be able to say to them, um, policy-wise, you should be deploying in a way that is um, beneficial prosperity-wise in the broad sense to the people of the Bahamas in deploying those monies for recovery, for repositioning, of the economies post an event. Now, at the same time, what this means is that the bank would not have uh, would not have the 60 million that would have been repaid from the Bahamas because of that exposure. So we have a liquidity shortfall. That liquidity shortfall means your Standard and Poor's, your Moody's, looking at the financials, sees a weaker bank. But what if we can redesign, redesign our liability side in such a way that that 60 million of the liability, the liquidity shortfall could be made up and made up in a particular way, whether it is because of increase in capital or a reduced obligation to pay dividends, for example, on the funding that came in to match the reduced inflow on the asset side, then that means, therefore, that the country can get the benefit. The investors would have contracted, for example, to receive a lesser amount. The balance sheet is neutral because the liquidity impact has been uh, almost hedged. And therefore, a credit rating agency does not uh, have any reason or room to change your credit rating and therefore your ability to be able to continue to borrow and to serve and service your countries remains the same. So it is that type of construct that we, uh, we, are, we are designing now. And in principle, that can be done through the use of SDRs. So one of the arguments um, that's being discussed in the international community is to repurpose some of the unused SDRs that developed countries have now and can be deployed for some purposes that are specific in terms of climate. Uh, that could be one. Or we can use that uh, the same SDRs or other issuance in terms of hybrid capital. And hybrid capital is not exactly strict capital, but if it is sufficiently of long duration, then what you can in fact have is it can be treated almost as if it were pure equity. And pure equity, as you equally know, you only get returns not on a contractual periodic basis, but on the basis now of your, um, your, your return profile, your profit uh, profile. And so if it is designed in a certain way that is acceptable as a broad class of instrument to investors, whether they be sovereign or private, and there's room to bring in a lot of the privates uh, in there, you can, in principle, have something that is near equity, that can be treated and viewed as equity, but can provide for the deployment of assets, both existing and new, that would allow you to facilitate countries being able to adapt and to make up when there is an event that occurs going forward. 
So these are all things that we are doing right now. Um, and as I said, uh, we are looking to begin to deploy those at the bank internally for the benefit of our countries. As I would argue as early as 2025, because we are already in the throes of um, development. We would obviously need to take some of that to further to our board, to investor classes that would be uh, want to look at this, test it, of course, with the credit rating agencies so that they are equally aware where we are. And we be, and it's part of what we, we are doing, we'd be sharing that with the broad in the multilateral development bank space. In fact, the, the, the monies that we are using in the design came as a grant. And I want to acknowledge that as a grant from the um, multilateral development banks, the MDB Challenge Fund, um, that's funded from a combination of Open Society, Bill and Melinda Gates and Rockefeller Foundation. And so we are most grateful for that. Um, we, we got that, that grant and award. And so we are using that with, uh, to work with Lazard to uh, develop that, that instrument. And of course, it will be for the global good. Uh, we would surely want to, to pilot it first um, at the bank, but it will be a, a global good that we are looking to, to develop. I know that we are um, out of time, so I just want to thank you. You've given us a lot of food for thought and a lot of, I think, fertile ground for additional discussion in the year ahead on a lot of these types of instruments and the way that MDBs can be piloting and learning from each other on how to better adapt and create the right mix of instruments to um, effectively finance not only climate, but sort of the real nexus between climate and a variety of other development challenges. Thank you so much. Thanks for listening to Climate Plus. If you enjoyed today's episode, please share it. And you can also leave us a rating or a review. If you want to share some feedback on this episode or have questions you'd like answered, we'd love to hear from you. Drop me a message on X, formerly Twitter, at Alter Igo or send an email to podcast at devx.com. Climate Plus is a podcast from DevX. Advat Saldinger was the interviewer for today's episode. It was produced and edited by Naomi Mihara. The series editor is Catherine Cheney. It's hosted by me, Michael Igo.